Welcome back, Mr. President. Great to be back. Glad to see you. Uh, how does it feel to be refocused on the singular task of heading and presiding over the Florida Senate? Oh, it does feel great. And we had an amazing year last year meeting those goals we had set at the start of the session. And of course, just a few days ago, we had our good friend Don Gates officially uh, being selected as the next Senate president. So it's great to be back in Tallahassee, a big task ahead. But I have uh, real confidence in the team we have in the Senate. Of course, my partner, Dean Ken, in the House, and our governor, who I think has really done a nice job this summer being focused on jobs and opportunities in Florida. Going into the 2011 session, uh, I know you were excited because you had worked during the campaign to try to assure that there was a conservative cast, a conservative environment in the Florida Senate. Explain kind of what was in your mind and what you hoped to have in terms of people to work with in the Florida Senate uh, before we get to what happened in the 2011 session. It was a long trek. When I first entered the Florida Senate, it was a moderate to liberal place despite being controlled by Republicans. And I felt strongly in, in my personal beliefs and my historical background that Florida is a center-right state, and yet the, the Senate was a center-left organization. And so starting in 2004 all the way to the 2010 elections, I wanted to find like-minded Republicans, people who in less government lower taxes, more choice in education, being pro-life. I aggressively went out, sought candidates, helped them get elected, and our goal came to fruition after the 2010 elections. And the kind of convergence of people who shared that philosophy, obviously Rick Scott, an outsider businessman, Dean Cannon sharing that same philosophy that's long been the case in the House. And I was proud to say that we had all the elements to find success, and so that was our goal. And so with that, everyone knew our agenda, and what was most pleasing about last year's session is that that agenda that we had laid out before the election, then once elected, and then was actually followed through into our legislative policies that passed last session. In one of uh, the statements I saw on the internet that, that you made, uh, let me see if I can quote you on this. You mentioned that the budget crisis that all of you inherited before the 2011 session, which was a $4 billion anticipated deficit in revenues, you said that the budget crisis you inherited, along with the legislature and governor, actually provided an opportunity to modernize state government, to modernize state government. Uh, a lot of people kind of approach that with the attitude, uh-oh, the sky is falling. We this is a terrible situation. Why did you view that as an opportunity to modernize? What do you mean modernize? Well, as you know, Steve, I'm very optimistic. And a lot of people never thought I'd be Senate president. I did, and I believed in that. But the more importantly, modernize is this. With crisis, the old saying is, comes opportunity. And clearly on pensions, on Medicaid, education reform, for that matter, balanced budget. We need to modernize those areas so that people have a more consistent government. I think we can all recognize the most broken system in government is Medicaid. It takes about one-third of our entire budget. There's a lot of pressure in Washington to change that, not for the better, but I think for the worse. So we saw this as an opportunity to rethink how we do some basic programs. That, along with the pension reforms, will save the state of Florida billions of dollars. I Meaning more money will go into the economy as opposed to spending on government, which is out of everyone's pocket. So we saw this as an opportunity, but we were also methodical in everything we did. On pensions, we took our time, got all the information. On Medicaid, it was a two-year process traveling the state. And finally, on the whole idea of how we balance the budget, I thought we did it again in a methodical manner. So this was well planned out, but as again, it was an opportunity because, you know, why be pessimistic? Let's look at new opportunities, and I think that's exactly what Dean Cannon did at leading the House, Rick Scott outside the box, and of course, what we did here in the Florida Senate. Well, let's talk about what many would say, whether they were conservative or liberal or whatever, was a radical agenda, and there were so many different pieces of legislation passed and signed into law that any two of them would have made a big session, but there were you know, more than 10 or 12. Uh, and they really affect a lot of people, as well as, quote, programs. Let's talk about Medicaid for a minute, a big part of the budget. I think 20 billion out of 70. 
A little bit more, but yeah, 20, okay. almost 23 billion now. What was the main concept? How did you, you know, reform Medicaid in, in broad terms? What happened? Well, first of all, in broad terms, it is a growing problem and growing and growing. As you know, with the new health care bill in Washington in 2014, the number of people on Medicaid will go from roughly 3 million, which we have today, out of almost 19 million. <clears throat> up to about four and a half million, almost a 50% increase. We knew that that was unsustainable. So we did, starting last um, summer, we actually traveled the state. As you know, my wife's a medical doctor. She has a unique perspective. But more importantly, we're looking to get hospital administrators. We're talking to people who are on Medicaid, the patients. That was the focus. So our goal was, first and foremost, try to have preventive care. So you're not going to the emergency room. The second point is put some accountability measures in play. I mean, taxpayers pay for this program, and it is a struggle to pay for it. We want people to be accountable if they're getting something for free, which Medicaid recipients are getting. And finally, by modernizing it, it allows us to save money with Medicaid so we can put more money towards education and transportation, let alone maybe lowering some taxes. Because with Medicaid being one-third of the entire budget, expected to grow under now the federal health care bill, we knew we had to reform it. But the focus was on the patient and being more accountable and so we can have a system that would be viable for everyone. Well, you know, kind of the concept uh, of Medicaid, uh, the original intention was to provide a safety net as far as med medical care is concerned and other forms of care for the poorest, you know, in our, in our capitalistic society. Do you feel now that, that this system has been changed and the way that you all changed it, that patient care has not been sacrificed for the poor? I, I think it will be improved because what you want to do is always take care of a problem early and not be, let it become an acute situation where you have to go to the emergency room. I mean, I think if you have preventive care, everyone's going to tell you that. The best way to stave off a problem is to take care of it early. And this is, again, signaling that very direction. And let's also be candid, finally, if you pay for health care to your own pocket, you're either on an HMO or a PPO. And that's all we're asking with Medicaid patients as well, is that they're going to be on the same type of program that people who pay for it in their own pocket. I think that's equal or level playing field for all. You're saying moving people more to a managed care environment. And I think we should. The only group I would not like to see in a managed care environment would be those who have some disabilities because they have such a unique circumstance. But if a person pays for a program out of their own money and a person who doesn't pay for a program out of their own money, why would a person who pays nothing into the system have a superior system than a person who actually pays for the system? We're just trying to make a level playing field. But I think the bigger concern is what Washington's trying to do is expand a program that that used to be completely broken. We're trying to reform it based on what we heard from patients, and I think that's a step in the right direction that respects the individual. All right, let's talk about the, the pension issue. Um, went from a defined benefit plan to a defined contribution plan, and, and now all the folks on the re state retirement uh, plan have to contribute uh, to uh, their retirement plan. And that saved, that's going to save taxpayers money. Um, why was that such an important agenda item? Well, it was very important because the same reason we talked about with Medicaid is that everyone has to have skin in the game, so to speak. If you're in the private sector, you're going to be paying for your own retirement plan. You're going to be contributing towards your own retirement plan. Florida was the last state to actually ask state employees to start contributing towards their own retirement plan. I'm a public servant. My benefits package should not be superior to the people who actually pay for my benefits. And so like in the private sector, we modeled it in that direction so that it becomes more affordable for the taxpayer. And there's a solvent system that exists in the state of Florida. And when people said, well, this 3% contribution is like a tax. No, it's not. And here's why. They're putting their own money into their own account. It's not going into the general fund, so to speak. And I think that's the right way to go. And that's, again, modernizing government. The defined benefits plan of the past was my father's generation. The defined contribution is the modern plan because people are more flexible, meaning they have more jobs throughout their career. It's not one of those, you, you get in one career after high school or college, and then you get the gold watch 30 years later. People are more, let's just say, mobile in their future years. And we think defined contribution reflects the modern economy. Well, I'd like to go through a list of all of the uh, many pass uh, pieces of legislation that were passed. Don't really have time to do it. 
I, I've wondered really how you got all of it done on such a rapid basis. Did you and the speaker and other leaders of the respective chambers, did you have a timetable that you said, we're going to do this piece this week and this piece this week? And I mean, I've never seen in my time of observing the legislative process so many major pieces of legislation flow through the process as rapidly. Can you let us in on the inside a little bit about how you did it? Well, because we told people what we did, and we did it. I mean, again, I, I invite you to go back to our talks from almost a dozen years ago. Everyone knew if they chose me as Senate president what our agenda would be. There was no mystery there, and that's exactly what we did. We said we're going to outline major programs. We're going to give it a full hearing. As you recall, all those major pieces of legislation we're talking about went through three committees. So this was not rushed through. Everyone had a voice, whether it be on a big program like Medicaid or on pensions or education reforms. We took our time, were methodical about it, but had a definite plan. I don't like this willy-nilly stuff. I like to have a thoughtful plan and then follow through with that plan. That's what I teach my children. That's what I push in my classroom. And that's what we try to do. And it made it that much easier when you had a true conservative like Governor Rick Scott, a true conservative like Dean Cannon in the House, and a newly conservative Florida Senate. We had a methodical plan. We, we put all of that in what I call the shuttle launch, where we, we planned it out so no one felt rushed in what we did. And that's why I thought we enjoyed that success in last session. And we're proud of our accomplishments. The problem is we don't have a long enough show to talk about them all. Well, we'll come back and talk some more. Okay.